Hi, I'm Bob Tabor with www.learnvisualstudio.net. In this module, I want to talk about the scope of Microsoft Azure's services. And the operative word here is massive. The scope of Microsoft Azure is massive in terms of the sheer number of solutions that it offers, the numbers of features that it offers, the number of functions that it encompasses, and so on. I, I spent a month, over a month, reading every blog post from the members of the Azure team going back two years. I watched every Azure Friday video from Scott Hanselman. I watched many tech ed presentations, including every keynote by Scott Guthrie. I've read, or at least I've skimmed through, a lot of the tutorials and documentation on MSDN. I literally took 400 pages of notes. So when I say that Microsoft Azure scope is so massive that it can boggle the mind and intimidate the hardiest of spirits, I know that of which I speak. So for me, one of the biggest challenges was to simply get my head around all of the new product names, as well as all the new terminology, all the new concepts, uh, and how it all interrelates to one another. And at some point, it occurred to me that I was going about getting my head around Azure all wrong. Instead of looking at each Azure services features and functions kind of in a vacuum, I needed to back up for a moment and I needed to think in terms of the common challenges that every business faces and what Microsoft Azure offers, if anything, to address those challenges. So in other words, I realized that every Microsoft Azure service and every feature that Microsoft implemented is there for a specific reason. It's there to address a common business problem or a common IT problem. So. Since I've worked at quite a few large corporate IT shops and I've worked as a one-man startup, I began to think in terms of the typical scenarios that I have faced in my own experience. And uh, then I mapped candidate Microsoft Azure services that could be harnessed to address those typical scenarios that I've encountered. So for example, let's start with a common public-facing website scenario. Uh, let's say it's an e-commerce website where I sell widgets or books or something along those lines, okay? Uh, at a bare minimum, every web application is going to need uh, a web server that'll host the web application. It's gonna need a place to store data. We're gonna need a way to cache parts of the application to, make, uh, to improve the performance. I'm probably going to want to add a blog if it's not already part of the application that I built. I really don't need to build the blog part myself. I should just be able to, to map a subdomain to a WordPress blog, a Joomla blog, or some other open source tool that I can get for free. Um, I may want a content delivery network that can ensure that assets like images and JavaScript files are available around the globe as quickly as possible wherever somebody's requesting them. I'm going to definitely need a backup and, and disaster recover, recovery strategy. I'm going to need a scaling strategy, uh, a way to handle seasonal traffic, uh, heavy traffic, or an unexpected spike in traffic without having to maintain uh, the hardware that goes mostly untapped the rest of the year. I'm going to want to monitor the performance of the web application on the hardware to decide when it's time to actually scale. I'm gonna want some visibility into the application as it's running live in order to help track down any intermittent issues that might pop up. So at a minimum, I want some good logging support and ideally I want some way to collect telemetry about a particular user's session to determine what exactly went wrong for them. Uh, and so that's base, a very baseline set of, of features that I'm gonna need, but I, depending on the type of application that I'm building, I might also need a way to manage logins and permission, uh, authentication and authorization for the web application. So ideally, it would support something like uh, multi-factor authentication. Ideally, it would utilize the open OAuth protocol so that users can create accounts using their existing social logins like um, Facebook, Twitter, Google+, whatever the case might be, in order to reduce the friction in signing up for my website. Or if it's an intranet application, I might prefer to authenticate and authorize using existing investments that I already have in Active Directory, which most Microsoft shops have. 
Uh, I probably want to give my users the ability to search my website for either content or in this case, a book or a widget, a type of widget. Uh, I, I'm going to need a way possibly to encode or even transcode any video that I have, some video reviews that I'm using to actually sell the widget or, or sell the book. Uh, I'm going to need some way possibly to stream it while protecting that stream from the possibility of being ripped. Uh, I might need a way to guarantee that the user's input won't be lost as they attempt to save it into my database. Even under tremendous load, I don't want a user's uh, purchase to be lost. So I'm going to need a way to ensure that that never happens. And I'm going to want to write to the database and make sure that it does not slow the database down, doesn't slow the application down. I'm also going to want a way to run backend processes at specific intervals, whether it's just to clean up some things or to, uh, to check or create some reports, something along those lines. I'm going to want some way to expose web services to partners so that they can build on top of my platform and extend my reach beyond just my customers to allow them to sell my widgets as well and make it look like it's part of their own storefront. Um, and maybe from a more strategic perspective, I want, I want uh, some way to take all of the metrics that I gather about site usage, about what people are even hovering their mouse cursors over, or uh, what, uh, where are the customers coming from geographically in the world, what products are getting views but not sales. I want to take all of that data, that everything I can collect, and I want to help predict customer behavior for future demand of certain products and certain services. And that's just the web scenario. There's also the mobile development scenario. I may need to expose a set of publicly available web services that are consumed by mobile or desktop clients, even iOS or Android, uh, to store data or possibly uh, to make available some other request on a centralized server. Also, I might want to enable notifications to the client's computer or the client's device, even iOS, even Android, whenever a certain trigger criteria is met. I may want to tell them of a sale or, or delivery of a widget that's on its way. All right. From an enterprise perspective, I want to be able to quickly provision new machines and data storage uh, mechanisms as needed to keep pace with the changes in my business. I'm going to need a way to quickly configure those newly provisioned machines. Let's assume they're virtual machines uh, with the right software and the right components. I'm going to need off-site backups. I'm going to want redundant backups. I want a failover strategy for my internal applications and for my, uh, even my external applications, but we're focusing inside the enterprise at this, at this time. And I'm going to need to manage user access to, uh, to new machines using existing investments that I've already made in Active Directory, Active Directory, like I said a moment ago. And I'm going to want my users around the globe to access the servers and the network resources in a secure manner. So that's from an enterprise perspective. From a developer perspective, uh, as maybe a team lead, I'm going to want, or my team might want to use agile processes to match requirements to developers, to monitor the progress of those assignments, to track any change requests that come in, to track issues, uh, to provide reporting to the team and to upper management. I'm going to need a development and staging strategy for changes in applications so that I can deploy them, test them, deploy them, test them, then deploy them and make them available out to the, uh, uh, to the intranet or internet at large. Uh, my company might already have a workflow that requires developers uh, to use a build server to build the software after each check-in uh, to source control. And uh, we may even want to put... Uh, uh, some things in place to deploy to staging or production directly from source control. I might need to load test my applications under development to find out how it would perform under heavy load so that I can make allowances for that and make sure that I can handle it when the load actually comes. And I might even, with inside of an enterprise, need to orchestrate some disparate systems. So in other words, I might need two legacy systems that were never intended to talk to each other to send messages to each other. So I might need to transform those messages. Maybe one's in XML and this one receives messages in a different flavor of XML or in JSON or something and to make sure that they can communicate back and forth. So I want to create a broker between the two that intermediates that relationship. So as you can see, there are an enormous number of, of Azure service offerings and I'm confident that I, I missed something in that list. 
Uh, I'm also confident that if there's a business-related technology need, uh, it probably can be addressed by some Azure service, either one that exists right now or something that's currently in the works. Now, the real problem isn't having options. The real problem then becomes, which of these options do I choose for my specific situation? And as I alluded to, I think in the previous module, it really comes down to a matter of how much responsibility and how much control that I really need or, or how much that I want to take on. And then I'll choose the best option based on that. And, and so there are, there are three basic levels of control and responsibility that you can choose in most cases. And it's, it's represented well by this little diagram on screen. If you need full control and you're willing to take all of the responsibility that comes with essentially owning that server, that includes patches and maintenance and installing the software, everything, then you are essentially looking for just servers in the sky, like I say. These are usually in the form of virtual machines that you can manage down to the last detail. So Azure services used in this capacity uh, are known as Infrastructure as a Service, or IaaS, or IaaS, sometimes it's called. Now, if you want to build on top of Microsoft Azure's platform of developer-friendly APIs, and you want to let Microsoft sweat all the small stuff, then you're probably going to be more interested in Microsoft Azure as a platform as a service, or PaaS. And then finally, there are applications that have been configured and deployed from Microsoft or from some third-party vendor. And um, all you really need to do is just create accounts for yourself, for your users, and then let them log in and do their work. In this case, you have almost no responsibilities inside of that system. Uh, you don't have to patch. You don't have to maintain anything. You don't even have to worry about maintaining the actual software itself. You, but you also have no control either. Uh, and so in this scenario, you typically term that as software as a service or SaaS. All right? And so Scott Hanselman has a really good analogy of this on his blog and in his talks that he does, choosing between infrastructure as a service platform as a service and, uh, and even software as a service is analogous to owning your own house versus leasing an apartment versus renting a hotel room. And so I'll point you to his blog post where he kind of makes that analogy here. And, you know, I just want to make this one quick little note. Sometimes uh, a particular Microsoft Azure service might straddle a couple of these classifications is Azure SQL, for example, is it PaaS or is it SaaS? Are compute services IS or PaaS? Well, honestly, it doesn't really matter other than to help you understand how two or more similar options that are available to you compare to each other. That might be the only way in which these classifications are really all that important. Furthermore, Keep in mind, as we talked about in the previous module, that you can mix and match services, regardless of which category that they're in, in order to create a single solution. So you might choose to be very hands-on with some aspect of the system. Say, for example, you want to be very hands-on with the web hosting portion. Uh, you might want complete control of the server that hosts Internet information services. But you're fine with being less hands-on with the administration of some other aspect in the system. Say, for example, you might opt to use SQL Azure instead of hosting SQL Server in a virtual machine yourself that you set up and that you manage. So you can combine and mix and match services across the spectrum of, of everything from infrastructure as a service to software as a service. You can also combine on-premises pieces of the puzzle with Microsoft Azure pieces of the puzzle. This is what we talked about in the previous module as well. So the combinations might seem endless, but the, the options are good. You get to choose the right mix uh, from, a, from a system and an application architecture perspective, and from a cost perspective, and from a maintenance perspective, and so on. Do I want to keep some of these pieces in-house and only uh, delegate some of the responsibilities up to uh, some Azure services, or do I want to load it all up there? You can mix and match as you will. The fact that you can mix and match on-premises within the cloud means that you don't have to be all in if it doesn't make sense for you to be all in with Microsoft Azure right now. Uh, in fact, I'm willing to bet that most companies just dip their toe into the pool before they actually dive in, a hybrid strategy, at least 
to begin with. Okay, so let's recap what we talked about in this module. We talked about the vast array of scenarios that are addressed by Microsoft Azure and then even mapped some of the services to those scenarios that you'll commonly see. We talked about the categorizations of services, including infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, and software as a service. And sometimes these categorizations can, be, um, uh, can help you differentiate in your mind how much control and responsibility that you're required to take on by a given Azure service. And then you can choose the right piece of the puzzle accordingly based on your tolerance for control and, uh, and responsibility. And then finally, we learned that Azure services can be mixed and matched, uh, that you can choose to employ some or all of the services for your particular solution, regardless of where the other parts of your solution are actually deployed, whether on-premises or in some other location and in the cloud. Okay, so that wraps up this module. We'll see you in the next one. Thank you.